welcome everybody. It's really good to be here with you this afternoon and uh, we are particularly blessed by this excellent panel that we're going to hear from. Uh, instead of doing a traditional land acknowledgement today, um, I am going to remind folks uh, that although this, this webinar is about 2S LGBTQIA plus uh, uh, support and, and projects. Um, it is also National Indigenous Month and next Wednesday is National Indigenous Peoples Day. And um, the moderator has put a special message together uh, for that. So we're going to put a link to that in the chat. And as she notes, tomorrow is really about, or sorry, next Wednesday, is really about uh, celebration of um, all that our Indigenous folks bring to our lives and communities um, and to honor their history and, and current contributions. Um, so I invite you to take a look at that, that video uh, where the moderator also offers, excuse me, a number of ways to uh, participate in that day, thoughts about, about how you might do that. And so without uh, further ado, I'm gonna turn this over to the uh, very Reverend Dr. Gary Patterson, uh, who is a foundation board member, past moderator, has been 46 years in ministry. So thank you so much, Gary. That is such a blessing uh, to the church and, and to the folks uh, whose lives you touch. So I'll have, pass it over to you and uh, look forward to this conversation. So, oh. Welcome friends, and I must admit, I, I'm just absolutely delighted to be here and to have an opportunity to hear the stories that uh, these three people, Angela, Robin, and Florence, they're going to be sharing with us. And what a, a wonderful thing to hear in, in a Pride Month. Um, as you probably know, I'm an openly gay person, and I just want to take you back 50 to 60 years and imagine me as a, a hormone-filled teenager who was struggling to, what was the phrase, to understand and accept my sexuality, which was code word for I'm gay and I'm freaking out and I don't know what to do. And I did a little research and discovered that the state declared that I was absolutely without doubt a criminal and some gay men were ending up in prison uh, indefinitely, which finally led to law change in 1969. I then consulted with the medical profession, which said that I was absolutely sick and needed years of therapy, perhaps including shock and conversion. And I still remain within the Catholic denomination as someone who is disordered uh, by my very nature. So then I turned and thought about church for comfort and realized that we don't talk about sexuality, particularly homosexuality in the church, even the United Church back in the 60s. In fact, in 1960, we said that being homosexual was incompatible with the will of God. So I realized I was a, a, a damned sinner. So it was it was not a, a promising beginning for an insecure teen um, at age 16 saying, yeah, I'm a criminal and I'm sick and I'm a sinner and I'm damned to hell. How am I going to make sense of my life? And so I, I actually take almost this wrinkle of delight um, some 50 or 60 years later to be moderating a panel um, within my, my family of faith my community and to say, wow, have, have we come a long way? I know there's lots of work still to do in New Brunswick is scary and around the world, there are still 66 nations that prescribe potential death sentence if you engage in any same-sex activity, Uganda being the latest and most egregious example of that. Um, sometimes when I've traveled I with my, my spouse, Tim Stevenson, we have to negotiate. Do we hold hands here? Oh, no, don't hold hands here. No, 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 go for two single beds. Um, but nevertheless, progress is, is really being made. And uh, I, I, for instance, last Sunday, two congregations of the United Church officially celebrated their becoming uh, affirming congregations, having gone through the affirming program or the Sacrament Ensemble program. And that, um, what was it? Five are celebrating this Sunday. Over 300 across the country are now officially affirming the congregations. 140 are still in the process. Hundreds are affirming, in fact, though they haven't gone through the process and need a lot of encouragement. So if any of your congregations haven't, let me tell you, it's a great process and it's wonderful. And if this were an endless uh, webinar, I could tell you wonderful stories of rainbow flags and people finding safety and, and wonder, but I won't. 
uh, because this is an opportunity to hear about the stories from our panel. And in a moment, I'm going to let them introduce themselves, but I want to just say hello to Robin Brown Hewitt, who is a, a longtime friend and is the uh, chaplain or the campus minister at Dalhousie. And she is here to speak on behalf of uh, Dal Out Leadership uh, Conference or Retreat. And I'm delighted to hear more about that. And then next to my screen is Angela Glazel. And she comes from Robertson, uh, Wesley Robertson. Uh, did I got that right? Wesley, I always mix those names up. Robertson Wesley, an affirming faith community in, in, in Edmonton. And she's here to talk about, oh, I, I'm quite fascinated. Um, community and connection um, to SLGBTQIA plus advocacy conference and uh, wondering what that will look like. And Florence comes from my own beloved BC. She is uh, an administrator and on staff at Kamloops United. And she's here to speak about a Kamloops after, uh, after school programming program for teens. And so um, this, this is going to be just quite wonderful that encompasses the whole country. And it will be uh, a celebration in Pride Month, but also hopefully an encouragement for all of us wherever we find ourselves in our home communities of faith to realize that the foundation, the United Church Foundation, of which Sarah is our president and on which I sit as a director, is willing and is eager to do um, funding for congregations or various communities of faith and ministries to engage in proactive support for the 2SLGBTQIA plus uh, community. You notice how easily that acronym rolls off my tongue. I've been practicing 2SLGBTQIA plus um, it's it's worth practicing if you're going to particularly speak from the pulpit and you, so one more time two s lgbtqia plus and then you can sort of watch and actually could do a sermon on the growth of that acronym starting from just gay to gay and lesbian to bi to trans to queer anyhow enough so i'm going to give our panelists uh, a couple of minutes to introduce themselves they could probably go on for five minutes, but uh, they've got only a couple. And also to give what you might call an, an elevator pitch about their program. We're going to be spending the rest of our time together hearing more about that, an opportunity for you to raise questions at the end after I'm finished with questions. And we're just eager to hear. So I'm gonna turn it, start on the East Coast with Robin and ask for that intro and the elevator pitch. What 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 is this leadership program? Hi, it's good to to be here with you with you all. Um, my name is Robin Robin Brown Hewitt, and I've been in ministry with the United Church since 1982. Uh, that's a while. A lot of those years have been spent with youth and young adult ministry. Uh, an example of that would be I was the director of the youth forum at the General Council in 1988, which may ring a bell for many of you. Uh, that was an interesting experience, uh, a good one. Um, I am now uh, the United Church of Canada Campus Minister at Dalhousie University, and I work there um, with Dalhousie's Multi-Faith Services Office. I've been there since 2015. Part of what I do, uh, uh, part of my job is focused on uh, partnering with Dal Out. Dal Out is Dalhousie University's Queer Student Society. Um, and I'm here today uh, to let you know about our Dal Out retreat last September. So that's all I will let, I'll say at this point. Thanks. Okay, thanks Robin. And Angela. Um, can we hear from you? Sure, thanks. Thanks so much for um, having asked me to join this today. Um, I'm Angela Glazel. My pronouns are she, her. Um, I identify as a queer woman and also a member of Robertson Wesley United Church. Um, I'm a, happily able to share that I found community and belonging at that church. Um, and I'm also the organizer of the Community and Connection 2S LGBTQIA+ advocacy conference <laughs> and it was um, a conference that really came about which I'll talk more about um, really came out of conversation but it's really the opportunity to bring together individuals and organizations in Edmonton 
who are doing work in the queer community and to hear from them about their challenges and their experiences, even their hopes, and um, really hear about what's going on for them right now. So, yeah. Okay, okay, sounds great. And Florence, can we hear from you, please? Hey, everybody, I'm Florence. I'm administrative manager at Kamloops United Church. I'm in my seventh year with the church. Uh, I don't come from a church background. I come from an arts background. Um, and when I moved to Kamloops, uh, however long ago, I started looking and was amazed at how the job description for the church weirdly mirrored all the experiences that I had had in life. <laughs> I remember reading the job description thinking, oh my goodness, how are they going to find somebody with such a diverse set of skills? And oh my goodness, it's me. Um, I, uh, I, the being at the church and serving that mandate, our specific mandate is to be a center for community and spiritual discovery. And what does that mean to you? Uh, it's a wonderful thing to, uh, to engage people into the community. Our program is an after school uh, for youth. So that would be people that are um, between like uh, 13 to end of school. People can take the bus themselves, who can get themselves places. Um, and the idea is to have a cafe, offer some food, a safe space, some opportunity for conversation, uh, and specifically um, programming for LGBTQ2S plus IA uh, members. We have some, we have one trans youth in our congregation, and we've had some uh, contact with others just through some other programs that we've done. So this just really seemed like an, like a something that this community needed, uh, especially coming out of COVID with the whole uh, isolation that everyone's been experiencing. Um, and so, yeah, I'll stop there. Hey, thank you very much. And in, in a sense, I'm going to just go back and have you go one, two, three, but give more detail. But just before that, I caught a glimpse um, of the chat box. It's hard to listen to both the speaker and look at chat. Somebody wanted to know just a, a little bit of the of what the acronym 2S LGBTQIA plus might mean. 2S um, has gone to the beginning. It refers to two-spirited. That's an indigenous tradition um, that in many ways parallels our LGBTQ. And then L, uh, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transsexual. Q is a wonderful embracing uh, queer, uh, though interesting, a few years ago, we announced the Year of the Queer in Vancouver, and a lot of older white guys like me went, no, uh, queer being a very difficult term when we were growing up. And anybody under 40 said, uh, excuse me, it's time for you boomers to grow up. Um, queer is being taken back and an inclusive word. I is intersex, meaning there are some people, particularly either in the biological or in a gender identity way, um, feel both physically and emotionally uh, that they are intersex. And A is for asexual. Some people say it, it ain't there, folks. Um, sometimes people say the I is also for inquiring and the Q is for questioning. They can be uh, multivalent and the plus is for everything else we've forgotten. So it just rolls off your, your lips once you get used to it. I can see, Karen, that you're almost practicing 2S LGBTQIA+. So, at this point, I'm going to go back to the panelists and say, can you help us understand um, what, what was the inspiration for this project? I mean, what needs in the community did you see? And how did you sort of bring the idea together on your own or with committee or with church board or with the campus ministry board? Um, how did it uh, start to develop? So uh, I might as well just keep in order so you know what's coming next. And Robin, I'm going to start with you. Okay, thank you. Um, back in October of uh, 2019, uh, the United Church Chaplaincy at Dalhousie was officially designated as affirming by um, the National uh, Affirm United. We uh, went through the process together. When I say we, that was the chaplaincy committee. I'm not, I don't have a congregation. Uh, so we adapted the process a little bit, and we believe we were the first chaplaincy in Canada to be designated this way. Um, but that designation doesn't mean a lot on a, on a large secular campus. Um, so uh, naming is one thing, doing is another. Um, 
So one of the things that happened in that process, though, was that my uh, job description was amended and adapted to include the words uh, to support programs and services that contribute to the creation of healthy, safe, inclusive space on campus. As far as um, identifying a sort of the needs or the gaps uh, in what I was doing and what the chaplaincy was doing on campus, Dal is, um, has an enrollment of more than 20,000 uh, students. And of course, um, you'll know that many of whom um, identify as 2S and so on. Many of the young adults uh, in the process uh, or in the process when they come to university of figuring out who they are, not just who they are away from family, although that's a big part of it, but who they are. Many, of course, maybe you've had this experience are feeling isolated, they're feeling unsafe, uh, and they are experiencing uh, times of endangerment or discrimination on campus. Some of the students who come our way have religious and spiritual roots that are a very, very important part of who they are. And some have had absolutely horrid experiences of religion. You won't be surprised by that. Although there are 15 members on the Dell multi-faith team, and they represent, each one represents a different faith community, you will appreciate that uh, of those communities, not all are on the same page regarding understandings of sexual orientation and gender identity. So the United Church Chaplaincy felt it was really important to become more visible on campus so that the students could find us and the staff to let them know that we are a safe place and an inclusive ministry. And when we say inclusive uh, in my work, inclusive also means um, people that are not United Church may not even be Christian. They may be Buddhist, they may be Wiccan, they may be Muslim. Um, people who are not associated with any religious community or spiritual practice are included in what I do. So we endeavor to make um, this commitment visible uh, and real by reaching out to build trustworthy relationships with student-led groups such as Dal Out by asking them uh, what kind of useful support the chaplaincy could provide and then providing it, and by supporting student-led events and activities such as um, protests on campus, uh, advocacy, and, and uh, a lot of fun stuff. It is university after all. And finally, by planning activities with Dal Out, uh, such as the annual Pi Day sale in the Student Union Building, with all of the donations from the Pi sales uh, going to LGBTQ uh, student bursaries. Mm. Uh, so that's, that's a little bit about where we started, um, how we identified the need. Okay. Who makes the pies? Oh, uh, there's a wonderful venue on campus called the Loaded Ladle. Uh, it has a very, it's a student run uh, food kitchen and they loan us their kitchen every year and some brave uh, souls um, and Dal out and I get together and we bake the pies mm. and they are for the most part edible uh, <laughs> and, and uh, very, very decorative and, and it's a lot of fun uh, just to to get our hands dirty. Wow. Sounds incarnational. Thank you, Robin. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Angela, could you tell us a bit more? Same idea, like what inspired this the whole notion of the conference? Um, and and uh what what I how did the ideas come together? Is is this your your brainchild or um just tell me more? Sure. Yeah, it really came from some initial conversations that was um happening, like happening with one of the ministers here at Robertson Wesley, happening with some other folks in our faith community. And we were just conversations coming out, like 
So we've been in affirming ministry since 2009, but what does an affirming ministry really look like? Like, I kind of like to look at affirming as like a verb, like it's a, it's alive and it's living. And there was a sermon that was done on Sunday and it was put really beautifully that it's not a destination. It's like a journey, right? So we just wanted to have conversations. What are we doing as an affirming ministry? What is that looking like? And so that led to other questions about well, what is our relationship with the queer community? What does that look like? What's actually from there, it came to be like, well, what's happening in the in the 2SLGBTQI plus community, right? And so we realized that after COVID, we weren't really sure about what was going on in the community. And it was really important for us not to say what was going on for the community, like what those challenges were, what those needs were. We wanted to go out and hear directly from the community. Um, and so that's sort of where the idea, um, we had a focus group with some members from the queer community who are also members at Robertson Wesley and we came together to explore some more things, um, explore some more issues, topics, those kind of things. And then we kind of came up with like the idea of a conference because we love the idea of bringing together the people who are in the community doing the work and who are right on like, who are doing like the grassroots work within the community and hearing directly from them. So this conference wasn't so much to meet a need, it was to find out what those needs are and what those gaps are and what's really going on. Cause you wanna really hear directly from the community. It's not about speaking for the community or making assumptions or anything like that. So, and it was a new, kind of like a new spirit of way of bringing people together, right? There's so many ways that the queer community can come together. This was sort of like a new idea to do. And it was really exciting for us as an affirming faith community to bring folks together. So we're bringing in individuals who are doing work in harm reduction and addiction, um, mental health. There's even like um, housing for queer seniors. Um, the challenges mm -hmm. that the youth are facing. So a very broad thing. We're also tackling things such as like, um, you know, unraveling religious trauma, which is a big thing for some of the people in the, the queer community as well. Um, we're going to have a little fun with queering the scriptures, those types of things. So lots of different stuff to really sort of um, show what's happening in the community and to share that. So it's like going to be like three days of a lot of like listening and sharing and togetherness. Yeah. When is this actually happening then? It sounds like I can next see week. if I can arrange a schedule or get next week. Next uh -huh. week is happening. So it's like, it's, it's happening. Yeah. <laughs> wow. That, that is so exciting. I really want to affirm your, your focus of saying, let's listen to the community, not speak for them, not assume, make assumptions about what they may or may not want. And as a as a gay senior, um, I think, yes, yes, there are particular needs, particularly around housing. I've heard from so many friends who go into care that it's like sliding back into the closet because so many uh, care aides come from a different background and don't have much knowledge or comfort with LGBTQ folk. Um, so that anyhow, um, I could talk all day. Um, thank you. Um, Florence, um, same question to you. Like what, what inspired the project? Um, what were the needs that you saw out there and how did it all come together? Uh, you saw a job description said, that's me. Um, but that's just <laughs> the beginning. Yeah, um, so, so the affirming group at Calvinist United Churches is, is very active. Um, we take the pie, the public intentional and explicit, um, you know, t as, as far as we can. And there have been a few things that have sort of led to this particular project. So. Um, one, we, you know, you do things and sometimes it resonates and sometimes it doesn't, right? Um, we were doing all kinds of things and, and it was, you know, it's, it's good. We painted the sidewalk in front of the church, the rainbow colors and the resonation was like, that was like the easiest thing we did. And it was like, oh, dang, it's, um, I, we were at pride parade that year. Um, I had people approaching me crying, you know, saying I, I, I saw that in front of the church. I, I, you know, I've lived here my whole life, um, and it was just so, uh, so deeply meaningful. And and these aren't necessarily people that are coming into church, right? Um, we are uh, connected with our pride uh, community, so they have meetings uh, in the building, um, and 
we had a, um, a trans member tell their story. So this was really sort of a big thing for me. Uh, listen to her tell her story and how, how all the way down to the bottom of like, just a really, I don't wanna put names on it, but just a really difficult, dark place before moving into um, their, their reality of being a, being a, being a woman. And, uh, and how, just how heartbreaking that story is. Contrast that with, we, uh, we were applying for summer students. We didn't get any this year, but we were getting summer students and hired a, a young uh, trans, I wanna say boy, man, <laughs> guy, <laughs> middle-aged, <laughs> you know, and still in high school person. And, um, and how all of that was available to them without having to go to such a deep, dark place, you know, with having, um, you know, the medical support and support through school somewhat, you know, there's an art school nearby downtown in Kamloops. Um, so lots of kids that are, you know, you know, exploring are, are, are you know, also in the arts, right, of course. Um, so just sort of contrasting those two it was, like, oh my goodness, we have come some far um, and then just sort of like gently engaging that person's experience with the church and getting some feedback from them, which was really, really lovely. Um, also through COVID, the church decided to engage with people by a lot of letters, right? Because that was a way we could connect with people. Uh, we sent Valentine's Day cards and, uh, you know, you know, letters. It's it just, you know, serious and fun stuff and just connecting we have a card a person who does cards in our church that's just like ugh, so beautiful um and some of the feedback that i got through a family who's belongs to the church but doesn't really come in a lot um is oh sorry i had some kind of an alarm there um is how connected they felt through those initiatives and how you know this young trans person so different person saying you know that's my church that's where i belong that's what accepts me, you know, but we don't necessarily see them on Sunday morning, right? Um, so to check my notes, there's, there's so many things, right? Um, but just those kinds of connections that have been coming our way uh, as a result of being public, intentional, and explicit, as a result of the big affirming banner about the little pride stickers, the rainbow flags, um, we initiated a flag system at the church. Every month we put up a new flag. So we're in an indigenous people's flag. And, um, and then we've got like a schedule <laughs> hmm. for the year because we were like, what's this month? And, you know, uh, so we've got all these gorgeous things that, that just declare, you know, that we're here, that we're for you, whether you choose to come in or not. So with this idea that coming out of COVID and the kids are, you know, sort of disconnected and isolated and the idea that we have access to this downtown community um, of youth who there's not a lot of programming for after school. So we thought, here's an opportunity. We're going to create space. We're going to put up food. We're going to allow, put, put enough programming to put to place so that it's, um, you know, it's a reason to come, but also like really sort of like draw out some um, um, self-directed right? What do you need? What do you want? Uh, and there's some summer, uh, you know, wait, that's the next one. Okay, that's it. <laughs> okay. One of the senses I think you, you can have from each of these is persons speaking, all, all three are, are full of excitement and energy, and the possibilities seem enormous. I, I want to just highlight um, the comment that Angela made of saying, becoming affirming is not an endpoint or a destination. It's more like a verb than a noun, and it's more like a a process and a journey. It sounds, Florence, like that's exactly what Kamloops United has been wrestling with as well, saying, how do we become public and explicit um, and, and inclusive? Um, and, and everybody knows it. Uh, and how important that is for people who may not show up on Sunday morning. I'm always struck by that, that rather sad or terrifying statistic that LGBTQ youth um, are three times more likely to uh, struggle with suicide um, ideation or actually kill themselves than their straight uh, uh, compatriots. So that there's enormous tension. And I also think um, I'm an older gay guy. And I sometimes when I'm uh, gathered with younger 
women and men and LGBT folk um, that that I am so old fashioned. I think becoming a, a gay white guy from middle class is so easy, and watching the focus of uh, social tension around the rights of people who are trans or bi or um, struggling or struggling or seeking gender identity. So um, it also ties in, I think, Robin, with your comments that when people are coming to university, uh, they're leaving home, but they're also uh, trying to say, who am I? This is the time of exploration and the need for support um, and to, to have a church community or other conferences or gatherings or campus ministries is so, so important. There are so many other questions, but um, what I what I'd want to ask is: so, uh, what have you been seeing? What, like, what are some of the outcomes? Um, you, you haven't actually had the conference, but you've had some of the conversations. Florence, you're saying um, the story of this this young trans person um, has been one of the outcomes of that. That's my church. Um, Robin trying to say um, you're not on the same page as all the other necessarily on the same page as other faith leaders, but so what what are some of the outcomes that you'd uh, talk about at this point? So back to the regular order, Robin, we'll start with you. Okay, thanks. Um, I've put a, a picture in the chat for those who have the access to the chat and you will see the crew that went away last September for a wonderful weekend in Lunenburg, uh, Nova Scotia, Central United Church uh, hosted us uh, gave us a meeting space and a kitchen. Um, I think um, a lot of congregations uh, may still be struggling with that uh, old saying, we've never done it that way before. Uh, my issue working uh, on a campus without a congregation is we have no memory of how anything's been done before. Uh, my, my community graduates every fall <laughs> and <laughs> spring. And there, so there's no necessarily no carryover. Uh, so it's uh, for Dal out, what that means for student groups is that they have leadership that's developed through two or three or four years and then it's gone. And this cycle keeps uh, going. So what the retreat uh, did was to provide a time away uh, for this. This is the, you're seeing a picture of the Dallow executive team, the leadership team. Uh, it gave them a chance to go away and, and team build because they've come from all over the place to Halifax. Uh, they did team building. And they planned an entire year's worth of weekly activities uh, for the coming fall and winter terms and put it all together in a huge map. It was amazing. It provided me uh, with the, the opportunity um, to build some relationships of trust. Uh, a lot of them, uh, as you could understand, were like, who is this woman and what is she doing here? And why is she making so much soup? Um, I, I start with food <laughs> and, and the opportunity to literally sit at the table together. One of the not on the agenda uh, outcomes was all of the side conversations that I had individually with the students as many of them told me um, about their experience of growing up in the church or in another faith group and what that was like for them. And, and they asked me questions about what I believed um, and why I was doing what I was doing. Uh, so it, it was really, really important to develop that trust. Uh, and it's, uh, the, a result has been for Dal Out that there's a sense uh, going now into the next year that there's, there has been a sense of continuity even though there will be a new um, executive team uh, coming into place in September, I have a little history uh, or they're, they're familiar with my name um, and what we might do together in the coming year. So that's, that's what the project, I guess, uh, supported uh, for them and for the chaplaincy. Is this your first uh, leadership retreat or is this something you do every year? 
Um, I'm hoping uh, with some ongoing help from the United Church of Canada and donors uh, to foundation, the Catholic you mean? You might be saying foundation. You never know. I see you Sarah go. smile. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's, it took, as you can imagine, it took uh, quite a long time to develop a relationship with Dal Out. And so last year was our first retreat, and they've all, they were already um, talking about this this fall retreat. Oh, excellent. That's good thanks, news. Thanks to the foundation. <laughs> Ah, can we, we put that in quotes? Thanks to the foundation. That we should <laughs> maybe start everybody. Thanks to the foundation. I'm I'm biased. Angela. <laughs> Angela. Oops, somehow I switched here. Yeah. I talked too loudly and too much, and the, the whole focus became me on the screen, which is a good reminder. We should <laughs> ministers should always have that. Angela. Um what what sense do you have again of you haven't had the conference but you've had a lot of the planning that's happening next week um mm -hmm. have you already seen some outcomes or are you and what are you anticipating as well sure i mean i think an outcome like in our our faith community first i'll start with that um because there were some when we started to when we announced that we were planning this conference and that we wanted to do it there were some folks um in our community and our faith community that were sort of like, well, why do we need the conference? Why is this important? We're already affirming. Um, didn't we figure out all this stuff in the 80s? Like there was sort of like, you know, just not necessarily maybe the awareness or the knowing of what's currently happening for the queer community. And then over the part, we started organizing in January. So over these months, um, the same people have come up and been like, oh, I just found out about this. I'm just learning about this. Oh, now I see why we're having the conference. So the, there's been that really great sort of um, outcome, I guess you could say, just within our own faith community of coming to realize, oh, this is really important. These are the reasons why we're doing the conference. This is really great. Um, and then, I mean, for what I've heard from the folks who are going to be participating in the conference, so the workshop presenters, the speakers, all of that, they're so excited about everyone else. Like they're super excited to be in the conference, but they're also super excited to hear who else is going to be in the conference. Like they want to go to each other's workshops, right? Like they're just so excited. So that's really great too that we, and these are folks that have worked together in the past and in some cases have not. So this is that opportunity as well for them to start building more relationships. So we as a commu faith community can build relationships within the queer community, but those in the 2SLGBTQI plus community, they can now start forming relationships that they haven't had a chance to yet. And that's mm. really exciting. So that's exciting. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. I noticed in the chat, somebody was uh, raising the question of how in these projects, but how the United Church um, can organize more with more focus as a pushback to right-wing fundamentalist theology that seems to be infiltrating schools or campuses or um, moving to school boards or politics. And just your description of enabling connections and community building with the church faith community as in the broader um, LGBT uh, community, the Q community, and then among themselves as well, like to be connected is part of that work so that we aren't just one or two pushing back but there's a, a gathering of allies and support so i appreciate that mm -hmm. and I, I meant to mention robin um my spouse tim stevenson when he went to ubc and to vst for studies there was a, a club on campus at the university of british columbia called gay ubc and he decided that with some help they were going to have a whole gay week to raise awareness um, on campus and the campus ministry was crucial for support um, and, be, and people again were startled saying we, we aren't going to approach a church or a faith a Christian faith community and so that kind of getting out there um, is is so good and so wonderful to hear what you're doing um, Florence before I keep talking uh, so some of the outcomes that we've been seeing are around safe space uh, so one of the things we've been doing is our thrift shop has an LGBT 
Q2S plus IA shopping night uh, once a month. So specifically designated time, um, specifically around trans folks, like maybe, you know, shopping might be a kind of a, a, a difficult thing. The, the young people that we have organizing it, because of course it's self-directed, decide they had a meeting with, they wanted a meeting with me and I thought, oh goodness, they're all gonna quit. <laughs> Right. <laughs> you know, volunteers, right? And um, so I said, we'll take them to lunch because I'm going to feed them so that they feel encouraged. And uh, they said, much to my absolute delight, it's been a year since they've been doing it and they wanted to have a celebration. So we had a fashion show. Uh, we moved some stuff around. We had an announcer. We had um, um, models from just everybody who we could recruit. Uh, a grandmother and her um, uh, in the rainbow grandson came and they both uh, strutted their stuff down the runway. And the thing that just absolutely just cracked my heart into was there was a, um, uh, we had little kids <laughs> going up and down the aisle. And um, so this, this, these two people were there and I walked up and said, Hey, do you know somebody? Cause models were like calling their family, get down here now I'm modeling. And, um, so I said, said, Hey, do you know somebody here? You just here to, to thing or you know, how'd, you, how'd you find us? They saw us online. Um, one of the people, it was their first experience of wearing other gendered clothing in public. Mm -hmm. Um, do, can we, do we have help for them? So I grabbed our personal shopper and she just went crazy grabbing items. The, the person, um, decided we had two fashion shows because one we planned and one we just recruited from people who were there. Um, and they went up and down the runway in these beautiful new clothes. <laughs> and, uh, uh, I mean, I mean, it's just such a profound moment. And the thing is, is it's not just that moment for that person. It's everybody else who stands and sees, who, who gets permission from that kind of bravery. Um, and what we did was we just had a conversation with a trans person who said, you know, shopping and then three, two, one, we're, we're in this experience. And the big thing about, about young people is, you know, we have a, 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 a good, this is 11 who may or may not be in the rainbow. Mom's not sure, but this kind of experience is one that uh, allows them freedom, at, freedom in, in space, in clothing, in a shop, in church. Um, so it all ripples out with every new moment. That's just a particularly gorgeous one. Well, that sounds absolutely impressive, um, delightful too. Um, some, sometimes I think that advocacy work or being involved in the struggle is deeply serious and uh, and it's wonderful to find that there are moments, and I should know that as a gay, gay man, but I'm a more serious gay man, that, that laughter and joking and uh, can, can be so important. And also as I listen to people, um, food and clothing and direct conversations, how important it is to keep thinking incarnationally, bodies and the, the basics that allow us to build those kinds of connections and be in solidarity. And sometimes it's just a matter of showing up. The fact that it can be in a church, I think is so important. In our congregation uh, this Saturday, they're going to, they've invited a couple of drag queens to come and do story time for children in the community. But last Sunday they were saying, Please spread the word personally, but we're trying to be careful with our PR because of uh, the fear of negative demonstrations. And so could everybody please come, even if you don't want to hear the stories, just in solidarity and support, um, just to show up. Um, and maybe that's part of our call as United Church is to show up and be supportive. I really, I, I like that. Uh, this is maybe going to be the same question, uh, but just differently phrased. You've, and you've partly answered it, but do you have a sense of how you've impacted the wider community? Um, it's been the faith community, um, almost by the very nature of what you're doing, Angela, it sounds like it's engaged the wider community, but can you point to anything specific or is there a particular incident or story that you, you might highlight of impact on the community from this kind of project? Robin. Um. I think I think in addition to the most important, what's most important for me, um, is simply the relationship and and simply 
uh, the relationship with the students on campus. Um, you mentioned uh, food. Uh, the sad fact is that um, student food insecurity is exceedingly high across the country. Uh, of all the cities in Canada, it's highest for people in Halifax. And in a recent survey, um, it was discovered that student food insecurity is highest at Dalhousie. Um, aye, aye, aye. So one of the ways I ran into that was uh, during the retreat, uh, um, I was the chief cook and bottle washer and crock pot maker. Um, and very quietly during uh, the second day of the retreat, one of the students came to me in the kitchen and said, Robin, we're, we're afraid you're making too much food. None of us are used to having more than one small meal each day. 74% um, of students on campus um, are, are dealing with a, um, no access to food during exam time. At the end of the term, it rises to 74%. So three out of four students are hungry when they're writing exams. So that's another, it was kind of an incidental part of the retreat mm -hmm. to have some good meals uh, over the weekend, but I think it mattered. And I think they know that they can approach me for food cards as well. Okay. Um, and another impact, I, I guess, uh, would be the United Church Chaplaincy's relationship with the other partners at Multifaith. Uh, they may not be able to support me um, visibly, uh, but uh, some of the other partners know uh, that, you know, we are an affirming inclusive ministry and they know that they can work with me if they choose to uh, mm -hmm. and as, as they're able to. Um, I think the best uh, feedback uh, that I could get to sort of tell me, you know, this is what I'm trying to do is, is having an impact is that I've, I've been asked to, to write letters of reference for some of the graduating Dalot students if they're going on to other forms of education or uh, applying um, to, to work somewhere. So that, that was very uh, important for me to be able to do that. Um, a big uh, impact for me uh, was I got invited to the huge Halley Queer Formal. Uh, the theme was Dress to Excess, and I had all kinds of trouble trying to figure out what that looked like. <laughs> not, not used to being able to dress to excess, um, but I, I was, uh, Dala provided me with those uh, tickets as their, as their special guest. Um, and in the picture I've, I've posted, uh, most touching of all, just recently, I was invited by several of the Dalla students to attend their convocation ceremony just two weeks ago. Um, and I was fortunate to be, be able to be on the stage with the faculty and therefore was able to give each one of them a hug as they got their uh, I was invited to the after party, which was awesome. <laughs> uh, and, and I think another form of important feedback was the messages I received from their parents, which I'm too emotional to share. <laughs> so I think there's an impact. There's an impact, it clearly spreading out in ripples. Thank you so much, Robin. Angela. Um, I think I'll add to that um, some of the impact to which I feel like it might have on like our on like our faith community is just how this will move forward our vision about what we have as an affirming ministry as a church like what that vision looks like. Um, I think that will this conference and this experience will help like will have an impact on that and where we go forward um, and also just with like you know, hopefully the impact will be is that more people will know from the 2S LGBTQIA plus community that um, we are, you know, we are a place that they can come to, right? Like we are a place of 
inclusion and belonging and safety, right? And then they can have that if they choose to, like there is a place for them to go. So hopefully, because I know that it's a lot for some people to even like enter a church, like we're having the conference in our church, right? And so we respect and honor that so much that that is, you know, really difficult for some people. Um, and so we understand that some people might not come, but those who do come, just being there and seeing, um, you know, who we are as a community, as like a faith community, um, hopefully for those who are looking for something, know that they can come there. So I think that that's an amazing impact. And of course, I already spoke with the impact of like all the, the agencies in the queer community coming together and what that could look like um, is really exciting. So it's, it's so exciting to like know what's, what's gonna like come from this, how things are gonna look, how things are gonna move forward, so. I'd love to have a chance to interview you or talk with you a month down the road to say, so how did it go and what are the outcomes from there? And that'll be yeah. exciting to hear about. Sure. Florence. Um, just want to say that, you know, to the idea that, that this isn't a straight line, it's not a train track, we're going to the goal at the end of the, at the end of the thing that is very specific, it's more like a spider web. Right. And there's all these different little pathways that could possibly happen, but none of them happen without the work that we're sitting on today. Like we wouldn't have access to even remotely having conversations with teens if we weren't public, if we if we don't march in pride. Right. If, if our little booth at pride isn't there where people go, oh, church, pride, really? And we have this wonderful little little pamphlet, everything that Jesus says or the Bible says about being gay and you open it and it's, it's nothing, right? It doesn't yeah. actually say anything about it. We make these little, um, you know, those little things where you go, you, you... <laughs> anyway, it's like a fortune teller with your fingers on paper and we uh, put little yeah. questions, you know, like, um, you know, you know what the church says about you and it, you open it up and says, you're awesome. And we just use those little things to engage people. Um, you know, having pride in our building, have their meetings, you know, that we, we've reached out, we're, you know, we have a relationship with them. And they uh, said a few years ago, why are we having our meeting in a church with all of the terrible history with churches and uh, Indigenous peoples? But they, but they had enough of a relationship with us, rather than to just dismiss us, they asked the question and allowed us to respond to the question, right? We were able to be able to be in that dialogue with that concern and then they said okay they they came they came and had their meeting and I popped my head in to say you know how's it going blah 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 and I overheard someone um being impressed by the fact that we have a, a, a gender neutral bathroom so the accessible washroom has a gender neutral sign on it and the most proud part of my tenure at the church is how boring that sign looks it looks like it's been it looks institutional like it's been there forever right it's just the way it is that that is a gender neutral bathroom so you know all of those things come together to create opportunities in that little spider web well, okay we got a thing with teens let's follow that one and see you know where we land with it and what other opportunity is gonna we're alive to that but we stand on the work that that's that's come before right Lawrence, I'm going to interrupt at this point and acknowledge that um, I think I was told that there's going to be lots of questions from all of you participants and we've run out of time because I found the panelists so intriguing and I tried to look at chat, uh, but not very successfully. So I hope you're not too frustrated with that. I want to say thank you to our panelists, given we only have a couple of minutes left. I have noticed a number of people saying, um, how can we work together? Or how can we respond to what feels like a rise in anti-2S LGBTQIA plus um, phobias right there? And there have been a couple of suggestions. One is just check out the National uh, Church page. Um, there's a, a statement issued in early June that could be uh, posted somewhere in the narthex or within your church building. Um, there's a resource that's been developed by Northern Spirit Regional, uh, sorry, region and a couple of other regions have worked with them that is also up on the web. Um, and I think if you look through, ah, thank you, uh, Ash, uh, that this is, is working here. Um, and also we just received a, a note, an email from um, 
Michael, no, Stephen Milton, who is the, one of the lead ministers at Lawrence Park Community Church in Toronto. And you might want to check that out. They have written a letter that they're inviting uh, be read in every congregation um, during the month of Pride that basically says um, there is no reason for hatred. There's no place for hatred, but you are welcome. You are safe. It's a very affirmative statement. And I gather that uh, a short time earlier, um, Stephen organized a gathering of many faith leaders at a press conference and hundreds of ministers and other faith leaders have signed this statement um, saying that the church is not the church that you see necessarily on TV with uh, extreme right evangelical condemnation, but it is a place of acceptance and of love. And I'm also supposed to put in, uh, I have but one more minute. I want you to just say, look, and say, look at these three projects. And they're possible, as Robin said, because of foundation support. And part of uh, my hope is that people will be more and more aware of the foundation, and they may make donations there, or they may put in program requests for funding and support. Uh, the grants that were offered to these programs ranged from 2,000 to 10,000. Um, some of them will extend over a couple of years for if it's long range. So do look that material up. Uh, think in your congregation what you might do. Maybe some of what's been shared here might spark ideas for you. I knew one church, for instance, that again, listened to the community and they offered in their church gym to put on an LGBTQ prom because uh, same gender couples were not allowed at the local school prom. So that there are these many different ways um, that the church can be public and um, explicit and uh, intentional and responsive and in dialogue. And together, we're making a big change. And as an older gay guy, I think, hallelujah, um, good stuff happens. And foundation and money um, enable some of that to occur. And then creative and forward-thinking people like Florence and Angela and Robin with their communities and connections, well done. So well done. And I thank you for your time and sharing this with us. And I hope it's been fruitful for all of you. I think over and out, you'd need to say anything else, uh, Sarah, um, as our fear this year. Thank you so much. And thank you, everybody. And uh, for all the folks who have been participating in the chat, it's just been really wonderful. Um, there are a number of questions about will this information be available uh, after this webinar? Yes, the recording. Um, the links to the to the programs and to the things Gary has just mentioned that'll all be in a follow up email. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And blessings on the rest of your day.